Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, certainly a pleasure and a distinct honor to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Mark Bochapin, who's director of the Division of Gastroenterology and vice chair for clinical affairs in the Department of Medicine at NYU Langone Health. Um, as I usually do, I'll start with his education, but I'll start at an unusual place, which is high school. <laughs> so Dr. Pochapin is a graduate of Spring Valley Senior High School, which is where I also went to high school, where he was editor of the school newspaper, which the next year I was co-editor of. <laughs> Not to intricate myself in New York City at all. <laughs> Obviously a hotbed of gastroenterology in Rockland County. And Mark then went on to uh, bigger and better things <laughs> at University of Pennsylvania, <laughs> where he got his uh, Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering and then his MD at Cornell, um, his internal medicine training at uh, New York Hospital, where he was also chief resident, and then GI training at Montefiore. After that, he uh, joined the faculty at Weill Cornell uh, in 1993 or so and rose to the rank, through the ranks to be associate professor of medicine. Uh, but also Chief of GI Endoscopy, a Director of the J. Monahan Center for Gastrointestinal Health, and Associate Chair for Clinical Affairs in the Department of Medicine. And then in 2012, NYU called, and uh, since then he's been the NYU uh, Schultz Leeds Professor of Gastroenterology and Director of the Division and Vice Chair. He's won many teaching awards and is uh, famous for his lecturing and teaching in gastroenterology and very active in many different GI societies. Um, in 2017, he became Vice President for the American College of Gastroenterology, and I think what he's best known for is his advocacy for GI health, especially in the area of colorectal cancer screening and GI cancers. He's a board member of GI Quick um, and a member of the steering committee of the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. Um, he is a doctor not only in the office, but on TV, radio, and internet. <laughs> but a real doctor in this case. And he's host of uh, Chief Rounds with Dr. Mark Bochapin on Sirius XM Doctor Radio. So we're very pleased to welcome him here today. And uh, he's, he knows he's among friends. And thanks so much for making the trip across town. I think one of the great attributes of being a physician in New York, and I know we have uh, fellow applicants here, is that uh, institutions may compete and may worry about rankings and all the rest, but particularly in GI physicians, it's an extended New York family. And uh, it's just so nice to see friends and colleagues here share some of the information, some of the passion I've had in this space in colon cancer, but um, to share ideas. And, and Jerry, first of all, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> You're, I believe the numbers go down at this point. So you should not change. I mean, I think, I remember when I was a fellow applicant, you were exactly the same, doing the same thing, the same enthusiasm, showing little holes your biopsy. I mean, honestly, it's just incredible. And what a, what a treasure for us, um, for, I mean, for anybody here, but for the younger uh, members in this room, Jerry Way is really one of the icons of the field, um, literally one of the founders of colonoscopy. And everything I'm talking about is really based on the incredible work Jerry and others have really laid the groundwork. Also, New York is really the site um, for the origin of a lot of our professional societies. It's just a very special place, and uh, particularly among the physicians, so I appreciate being here. And it's special not only in terms of uh, what we talk about, what we get excited about, but where we came from. This is a <laughs> what a beautiful high school. I mean, come on. Can we go to the most beautiful? It has not changed. It's beautiful. It fits my memory. But, yeah, it somehow was a hot gastroenterology. <laughs> Well, you ever see Sid's show where they had the first national polyp study meeting in yeah. Queens? So, yeah. anyway, I think, Jerry, you're probably there, right? Um, and this was our logo. Well, no, the tiger didn't look as mean back then. <laughs> it got a little meaner looking. Anyway, uh, I don't think either one of us was on the foot. We're on the football team. No. We were, we were, we were, we were, we were the on the, We were so cool. We were, we were the coolest at the end of the newspaper. But there was one thing we could do. We'd take a road trip down to White Plains, which is where they did all the uh, mock-up for the newspaper. And um, we would, that was our big thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Disclosures. Maybe someday I'll have some stock options. Really, I, I told them a few things, and now it becomes a disclosure. But I think we have to be very careful of what we disclose these days. So I'm going to make 
make sure I put it there. Um, and I want to, there are a lot of things I want to discuss. Um, I was asked to discuss quality. Truthfully, Dave Greenwell is one of the world experts in quality. Um, but I always like to look back a little bit to look forward. I think when the two societies, the ASGE and the ACG, got together and said that quality is a priority, I just want to read the quote that was in that original article. ASG and the ACG recognize that if we do not develop evidence-based quality measures, an administrative or governmental agency without experience or insight into the practice of endoscopy will define these measures for us. That was really very intuitive, and I hope we always as a profession look forward like that and say, don't bury our head in the sand, let's get out there in front and state what we think are the important quality metrics. The original article was published in 2006. It was revived in 2015. There are 23 endoscopic indicators and 15 for colonoscopy. And I just want to um, highlight a few things. Um, these are the uh, indicators pre-procedure. Notice that uh, the surveillance intervals, including the 10-year screening for negative average risk colonoscopy, is actually a level 1A um, evidence. So I think we should feel comfortable um, waiting the 10 years. And also, as you'll see, the appropriate interval recommendation is also a quality indicator. Now, that's being looked at and maybe down the road, and I'll show you some of the less invasive technologies that are being developed. Perhaps we might have something we could do within the 10 years, but it is level 1A evidence, and I think we do have to really respect the surveillance intervals. Um, the prep quality has also become a quality metric. And notice that the performance target, I can't read the back, is 85%, meaning that we're now responsible for making sure that at least 85% of our patients have a good prep, uh, a prep that will not change our recommendation for callback. So again, prep is important, as we'll see in the quality metrics. And, and actually, as we saw in the, uh, the cases that we, we just looked at, Without a quality prep, you're not going to be able to see little holes in the colon or <laughs> particularly the flat pulp. ADR we'll get back to. That's really our best quality metric. It's also the most validated. Um, and then withdrawal time, if the patient has bi uh, diarrhea to biopsy for microscopic colitis, the frequency of IVD surveillance, although, again, that's, that's not great evidence. Um, removing every pulp you see, unless it's large pulps, and you refer to Jerry and others. Um, and then after the procedure, perforation, making sure there's consent, uh, post polypectomy bleeding, and timing of follow-up. Just again to remind everybody over and over again, every study has shown split prep is better than um, single dose prep. No matter what you're splitting, splitting the prep and getting that second dose closer to the procedure will actually clean the deep aspect of the ascending colon and cecum and make uh, it easier not only to see polyps, but particularly the flat polyps. And take the picture. Look, it's beautiful. There's a beautiful, beautiful geometry to the colon. I just don't you love going into the ilium and just, just exploring. You, you're like finding Nemo or something. It looks like a coral reef in there. Unless, of course, they have Crohn's disease. Then it looks, it looks like uh, one of the coral reefs that's been too many uh, times looked at with scuba diving. But, um, but take the pictures. No one will ever question that you reach the cecum. With interval cancers, this is absolutely essential because um, when you have a photo like this, you know you've been to the origin of the colon. Um, so GI Quick was really an interesting concept. It really was the brainchild of Irving Pike. Right now, Glenn Eisen is the current president. Again, society's working together collaboratively. And for those of you who don't know Lori Parker, um, Lori has been running GI Quick and is one of these people, the unsung heroes of our quality repository. And are you guys using GI Quick here? Now, I know, you, I know you have it. I don't know if you sometimes you have it, you don't necessarily use it. We've been struggling with trying to make sure that it gets yeah, implemented appropriately. But when, it's really incredible. When was, it, when was an outside eye resident? Yep. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. There you go. It always seems to come back. So <laughs> whatever. Um, also from Rob. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we're up over 7 million colonoscopies in June. It's amazing. It started in 2011. We've had uh, 100,000. We're over 7 million. I implore all of you, the director of research is Dave Greenwald. Talk to him about ideas you have using this database. This is an incredibly rich database of over 7 million procedures that can be used to look at different metrics. And we're looking at it now to figure out what's the um, incidence of polyps in young individuals. We just don't know. What is that number? And so by going back now and looking at all people who've had colonoscopy under the age of 50, we actually might be able to find out what that number is. Uh, also, the Hawthorne effect is, is very strong with uh, propositories. The more you look, the better you do. And um, starting in 2012 and 2016, and actually has continued, although it's beginning to level up, 
the ADR numbers, which um, for uh, diagnostic was 22%, but really for screening we're most interested in, started out in the low 20s and now is close to 40%, meaning that just by looking at ADR through a repository makes it better. Um, and ADR really is a validated metric. If you look at the top graph, you'll see that the yellow line here is the cumulative hazard of ratio for the best or highest ADR detectors. The higher your ADR, the lower your cumulative hazard, hazard ratio is for <coughs> developing an interval cancer. Um, it makes sense, but what's nice to see it validated. And even more importantly is that if you look at the lower graph, as you improve, if you go one to two or three quintiles improvement, so for the poor ADR performers, going up to the high ADR performers, the interval uh, cancer risk drops as well, according to the adjusted hazard ratio. So the highest ADR um, uh, performers will have the lowest interval cancer rate, and if you improve your ADR, you drop down to that same level. So it's never too late to try and improve our technique. Because we know when we see a polyp just sitting there, it's a great thing, and it, it's grab the snare and you really can make a difference. But there will be times when we find the polyp and when we don't find the polyp, and if it's hiding behind a fold, then um, we may not see it. And truthfully, even if you look, there's a technical limitation to this procedure um, for everybody except for someone like Jerry. But other, uh, for mere mortals like the rest of us, um, there's a technical limitation. And so how can we do better? Because we are going to miss polyps. This has been known for a long time, over 20 years now. If you go back to 97, Doug Brecht published this article, which was really controversial at the time, that they did tandem colonoscopies, one right after another, found an overall miss rate of 25%, but the variation of miss rate really depended on who was doing the procedure. Prior to that, we thought anyone who could do the procedure is trained was doing the same quality procedure. It turns out that miss rates are very different by endoscopists. We know that. People um, have different ability to find and remove polyps. And the larger the polyp, the less the miss rate is. Well, that's good news. But when we start looking at different types of technologies, like CT colonography, retrospect, retrospective looks with um, retrospectoscopes using a third eye and others, we start seeing that in blue, all adenomas start leveling at about 25%. I miss about 25% of all adenoma. Good news there is most of them are small, but we're probably missing about 10 to 12% of advanced adenomas. And when you go looking at other technology and you're doing these tandem procedures, you start finding that we're missing um, adenomas. So I had to bring this picture. I had to, because I've been showing this picture for 20 years. I started, I was talking about EUS, because when we started EUS, it looked like a bad television with just a lot of snow on it. And yet, when those of us who do the U.S., you start seeing image, and others might not see it. Now, how many of you have seen this image before? Okay. For those of you who have seen the image, what is it a picture of? Who have seen it. Who have seen it. Those of you who have seen it. A cow. A cow. For those of you who haven't seen it, do you see the cow yet? How many of you do not see the cow? Okay. So let me show you. Here's the head. Okay? Do you see the cow now? Here's the head. Here's the body. I will tell you from now on, if you ever see this picture, you'll always see the cow. And it's all about training what to look for. And this concept was great for EUS, but it's even better for flat polyps. The reason being that, um, so take note, in uh, 2008, wrote this article, which really changed our perspective, at least my perspective, because we didn't think that flat polyps existed in the US population. We thought that was in the Asian population. It was a different demographic, a different disease. But it turns out if you look for them, look for the leading edge, uh, retro, re the scope, that actually about 10% of patients in this VA population had flat polyps. Now, they were given four liters of polyethylene glycol and magnesium citrate. This was like a triple prep type uh, of um, procedure. So these patients were cleaned. But up to 10% had these flat polyps. And these flat polyps, to me, are one of the most serious things that we're dealing with right now. <clears throat> It really comes down to quality. Not only do you need a good prep, but you need to know what you're looking for. And in this paper by Crockett, you could see the three sessile serrated lesion. Here's one. Um, you can see the leading edge of the other. And this, I, we call the egg drop soup sign because you get that um, little bit of mucus with a little bit of what looks like egg, egg drop soup just sitting over it. And then you can see the change in the uh, pattern of vascularity here 
on the surface. So we need to know about sessile serrated polyps. And the reason they're so important, they probably rep represent somewhere between 20 to 35% of cancer because they go through a different pathway. They go through a hypermethylation and perhaps an activation of the mismatch repair genes, the same uh, mismatch repair proteins in the same way that Lynch syndrome may do it at a uh, genomic level. This is an epigenomic, epigenetic level. This is, this is a process in which can happen locally, but I think can hyperaccelerate. I really worry about these things because when you look at them at the local level, they don't look that different from what you might see in a Lynch patient. And so I think we can miss them. I think they can move quickly and we might not remove them uh, completely. So the more difficult to detect, not only do we have trouble on colonoscopy, but we have trouble on CTC. They're less likely to bleed, so they probably will not be detected on FIT. And that's actually where the DNA, when you look at um, the deep sea study, which uh, which I know you all know about, <laughs> because Steve uh, is really one of the lead authors on that study. When you look at that, and you look at the um, ability to detect polyps, particularly sessile serrated polyp, actually um, adding the DNA to the FIT makes it a much more powerful test. Um, but they're less likely to bleed, so FIT will likely miss it. They're more difficult to remove, and when you go back and you look at uh, these slack polyps that have been removed, <coughs> up to 33%, up to a third of them, actually have been incompletely removed. So it's really important to use appropriate technique. It's helpful to use a dye underneath. It's absolutely essential that you look at the edges, and, um, and Jerry can tell you a little bit more about what, how he treats the edges. But if you're going to do a large piecemeal polypectomy, you really should go back and look at it uh, to make sure that it's fully removed, particularly the, uh, the large flat ones that we find the right colon. And I'm concerned about this, and um, although we don't have as good data to suggest that we need to change the surveillance intervals, it's important that we do follow the surveillance intervals, particularly on the large polyps. And if there's any question about it being completely removed, go back sooner than later. So I thought this was a nice diagram um, in Crockett's paper, really looking at the three areas that we need to be very uh, aware of. First of all, if we have rapid progression, we have to make sure that we have the appropriate surveillance intervals. If they're difficult to see, we have to optimize our ability to find them. And if they're difficult to remove completely, we have to make sure that we remove them completely as well. So um, we don't want to miss them. We don't want to completely resect them. And we certainly don't want to develop an interval cancer. So this paper by Barclay was um, also quite revealing, saying that you know, it really does matter whether you withdraw the scope very quickly, less than six minutes with a uh, ADR of 11.8% versus greater than six minutes of an ADR of about 23%, I mean 20, 29%. Um, the issue is, is that when this has been looked at multiple times, it may not matter as much. And um, when you look at large cohorts of physicians and you look at the ones who have the highest ADR to the lowest ADR, there probably is not that much difference in their withdrawal time. And so compliance may increase, but in some studies like this one by um, uh, there's really not much change in the level of ADR improvement. However, the technique seems to be the thing that we keep coming back to. And um, this is one of the first papers to really look at that. When you have a video recording and look at technique versus just measuring the recording re withdrawal time, and you look at folds, distension, the cleansing, um, really looking, moving back and forth, and a lot of people now use the technique, pull back to the um, pathic flexure, and then you head back down to the cecum, in a sense, doing a mini tandem colonoscopy with the right colon. The better your technique, the better your ADR. And the ones who, again, had the highest ADR versus the lowest ADR had really no significant time difference in withdrawal. However, the technique was the one that had the most difference. So technique matters. Report cards matter too. Again, the Hawthorne effect, telling people that they've had, that they're being monitored and reporting their metrics. And some units actually will have a grid most of them don't have the names, although I hear some of them do have the names, but you'll see the person who has the highest ADR and the lowest ADR, and they'll be labeled A, B, or C. And so who's, who's C? I'm not C. Who's C? Who has that low ADR? So, you know, a little competition. Not that any of us are competitive, none of us are competitive, <laughs> but a little competition does help in this space, and there was a 10% improvement in ADR detection. So what did we learn about quality? Quality is operator dependent, that nothing's 100%. We have to recognize that, that we will miss polyps and that there will be interval cancers. Our job is to minimize both of those because the
great job, have a high ADR, and follow all the quality metrics, the interval chances are actually quite low. Um, we need to track quality, we need to teach quality, we need to talk about it all the time. And um, addressing quality improves quality. So let's talk a little bit about guidelines now. So these are the multi-society recommendations that came out last year, listed in three tiers, colonoscopy every 10 years, or FIT. Um, good news is, is that CT colonography and fit fecal DNA, or Cologuard, are now part of the formal guidelines. Um, they're tier two. Uh, however, they are validated. And um, the issue with CT colonography has always been that if you're already going through the prep, most patients just want to get the colonoscopy over with. Um, truthfully, CT colonography should not be done unless you could do the colonoscopy on the same day as a positive CT colonography finding. Otherwise, putting a patient through a double prep really doesn't seem appropriate. Um, as I said, with the DC study, you guys all know about uh, fit fecal DNA. Uh, right now, the intervals every three years. That's probably not as validated as the actual screening with the, um, with the combination. However, I think we're getting close to have, feeling more comfortable with that. And then FlexSig, although it's not something that we see much in this country, is used globally and is still recommended um, uh, to be every uh, five or 10 years. Um, capsule colonoscopy made it on the, on the grid. I don't think anyone is truly using it. I know some people here have done some research on capsule, capsule colonoscopy. And the septin 9, which is the blood test I'll talk about, did not make it. Um, and I'll show you the data for why that's the case. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. This is a governmental agency put together people to look independently at the data. And in the past, they've made very specific recommendations. This came out in 2016, and basically, screening works. That's, uh, that's the, I can't get any more out of this other than screening works. But um, the problem is that this is the guideline that most insurance companies will go to, particularly uh, Medicare. What Medicare says tends to be the uh, template for other insurances. So it's important that it gets a little more specific so that we can make sure that the coverage is appropriate for the tests that work. So this is the Davis Atkins family. And Len Atkins died at age 48 from colorectal cancer. His son actually now has become a big colorectal cancer advocate for earlier screening in African Americans because had he been screened at the current guideline of 45, he might be alive today. Um, what's interesting in African Americans, if you look at the uh, incidence rates, which is on the left, and the mortality rates on the right, the higher green graph, green line, is the line for African Americans, both higher incidence and higher mortality. And even more importantly, when you look at age adjusted 20 to 44 incidents, the dark blue line is the African American uh, incidence. So the incidence is higher for younger adults, the incidence and mortality are higher overall for African Americans. This made perfect sense to start the screening age of 45. And actually, um, the American College of Gastroenterology put it as one of their guidelines. And ultimately, the multi-society task force followed suit um, and made the recommendation that screening should be given at age 45 for African Americans. Now, just as a little preview, I'm going to get back to this. You probably heard the American Cancer Society just recently came out with their guidelines, which surprised all of us, really shocked all of us, because they dropped the screening age to 45. And they used two micro simulation models, which actually were published in the same issue of cancer that the guidelines were published. So in, in, that, in many ways, it surprised us because we had at the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable meeting. But I was honestly shocked to see that they dropped it to 45. And just yesterday, David went to Washington. I was on the phone. But there was a meeting to talk about what the implications are and how we actually come around this. I'm going to get to the data of why we dropped this in just a minute, because obviously it means it's about the younger incidence of colorectal cancer. Sid Winower says at best, the best test is the one that gets done, and now we just extend this with all the quality metrics, the one that gets done well. So we need quality, but we also need to make sure that we educate how to do the best quality and technique. So where are we going? Okay. This is really one of the most exciting things that I've seen in my career, because um, colonoscopy, first of all, was not a screening test. It was initially a diagnostic test. And for those of us who remember, when we wanted to use it for patients we knew were at high risk, we would say, haven't you ever seen a little bit of blood, maybe on the toilet paper? Because you couldn't just write high risk. You would, you would have to come up with a diagnostic criteria, and rectal bleeding was the one that was always accepted. And then in 2000, it became 
a uh, metric for screening. You could use screening in the guidelines to use uh, for a reason to do colonoscopy. And the top lines at the 80 and 90 level are pap smear and mammography. So we really went the way of the gynecologists where they were so good at screening for breast and cervical cancer, really the model. But colon cancer screening at that point, really with FIT or, or actually with the GWIAC, started in the 25 to 30% and has steadily increased. And this has been really a remarkable change. And we're trying to get to 80%, you know, the 80 by 18, and actually David's gonna talk about it at the upcoming ACG meeting in Philadelphia. But what's been so exciting, if you look at the SEER database, you have a dropping incidence, and more importantly, a dropping mortality in colorectal cancer. This is something we should all feel very proud of because it really was being proactive getting our patients screened. There probably is a component of a healthier lifestyle and dropping the smoking rate, but this is probably screening. Here's why. We hear so many bad things about our country, but here's something to be <laughs> proud of. This purple line represents the United States, and this is the colorectal cancer incidence trend um, for the country. Notice that the U.S. is one of the few countries to have a dropping incidence of colorectal cancer. Almost every other country, and some cool countries too, like Canada, you know, they're so cool with their healthcare system. Um, and, um, you know, Australia. Other countries are having a rising incidence. And why is that? It's probably because other countries are going more of a minimally invasive route, more of a stool based testing for microscopic blood route. So they're picking up more cancers. But by going colonoscopy based, we're actually dropping the incidence of cancer. And although the mortality is dropping in probably every country, Making the incident drop in the U.S. is really something to be proud of. But, I mean, you know, you'll also notice that the rates were dropping in the late 1980s in the U.S. Yes, and that's correct. Colonoscopy as a screening tool was not introduced until 97. So the trend had already begun to decline. And so there's a lot of, yes, that's why there's trend, probably. And I do agree screening is clear, and with colonoscopy has really helped. But we can't be so sure that it's. How much of it I agree. Is that's why. That's why I mentioned. I think yeah. lifestyle changes. I think stop smoking. Um, there's definitely other things going on. And um, some people say that Ronald Reagan, uh, when he got colon cancer, was right around the time of that inflection, and that there might have been more awareness at that point. So um, I don't know, Steve, but I think it's a good point, and I agree. As much as we want to pat ourselves on the back, we have to do it with uh, with, with trepidation. Um, here's just some other countries. Again, everything's really heading up. Um, uh, particularly like in Finland and England, the rates are really going up, but I think that's because we have early detection. The mortality is dropping in these countries. Um, so we're doing a great job. How can we do better? I love this quote by uh, Maya Angelou. It says, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. So how can we do better? So where are we going with technology? So there are a lot of things that are happening to scopes. Um, we have different attachments. We have the, um, this is the endo cuff, this is the GI balloon, this is the endo rings, and this is third eye reinvented, reinvented itself and has a panoramic uh, view. Where it looks very much like the fuse, which we no longer have access, which is no longer really being used, which had three cameras on its side, or a hyper um, retroflex scope that's being made. So there are different designs, there's different techniques, and how do we do with them? Well, it's interesting, none of them ever get to 100% where we miss nothing. We just miss less. What always worries me is that whenever you see these studies come out, we miss more and more on conventional colonoscopy, 30 to 40%, but a one or two millimeter adenoma is actually gonna register as a miss. And, and we'll talk about that, what's the significance. But they do miss less. And the question is, how do they stack up? And all these studies are done differently, so it's hard to really compare them one-on-one. -on -one. So when you have difficulty doing that, you want to try and compare what you're actually improving and then maybe do a meta-analysis of all the study. So comparing what's actually happening, this, this study by Brand looking at the fuse, the third eye, and the endo rings. And there are a few important things which I think make sense for anybody using these technologies. One is that um, the miss rates were lower, as I showed you, but we had an improved sessile serrated polyp detection. We're able to see the flat polyps a little bit more. But the larger polyps, the calculated polyps, the advanced adenomas, they were not really statistically significant. And truthfully, do you really need something on the scope to see a larger polyp? Probably not. 
But what's interesting, because we're seeing more smaller polyps, the intervals for follow-up become much less. So there's much increased utilization of colonoscopy because of these devices. And is that really making a difference? That's what needs to be studied. Yes, we're finding more polyps, but would it have mattered if we found it in three years or five years or 10 years? And we don't know. I mean, this is something that we have to look with more prospective studies. Um, Seth Gross, uh, Violetta, and others put together this nice meta-analysis looking at the different type of enhancements. So the mechanical enhancements would be anything that pulls back the folds mechanically, the uh, GI balloon, the endocuff, the endo ring. And then the optical would be like the third eye or the fuse scope looking at uh, imaging to try and look behind the folds. And it looks like there's a slight advantage of um, adenoma detection rate in terms of the mechanical versus the optical. Um, and I have to tell you that I actually use the endocuff on every one of my colonoscopies now because most of my patients are high risk. I love it. I don't know if you guys use it here, if you're using anything. Just and kidding. It, it takes a little bit. It's a little bit like um, going from a sports car to a little bit of a mid-size. You know, it's a little bigger to use. But truthfully, for the patients who have um, real tortuous colons, unless they have a real tight sigmoid, it actually helps you um, get a shorter scope because you get a little bit more of a grab when you withdraw. So I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, if you want to talk about this afterwards, I'd be happy to. But um, I also find that it helps me pull back the folds, particularly when I'm using a polyp behind the fold. Um, but again, it's preference. And as I'll get to a little bit later, I don't think you need to use any of these top technologies. I think the key is to make sure what we're doing well, we do as, that we do as best possible and we just maximize our quality metric. So do these improve? But I think they have to be studied. How many of these polyps would have been picked up on a surveillance colonoscopy? The two millimeters now, if I go back in five years, even 10 years, so what would it be then? Eight millimeters, a centimeter? Um, are we really preventing cancer? Are we just increasing the intervals or decreasing the intervals in which we're doing colonoscopy? Um, how many of them are advanced? And does it increase our ADR? If our ADR is one polyp or five polyps, for that patient, that patient still registers as a single patient. So again, we don't want technology to act as a substitute for quality. I throw this in for Chris. This is now, I just threw this in because I don't know where this is going, but this is fun. And for those of you who may know, I'm also a big Trekkie. And this thing really is science fiction. Um, what, what the um, endorobotics team who make this device, which is a robotic endoscope basically, are impressed at how and endoscopists so quickly pick this up. And the analogy that I've been using is that it's kind of like driving a stick shift and then asking someone to drive an automatic transmission. I mean, think about what we're doing with an endoscope. We have, um, you know, really dials that are pulling um, metal wires. We have one uh, channel, we're moving our body. But what we're able to do with the type of technology we have, imagine if we now have opposable instruments which is what the robot allows you, where you can literally grasp a suture with one and hand it to another. Um, and this thing, this device right here, um, see this black little ball? This thing's like driving the space shuttle. I, <laughs> you just drive this endoscope in robotically. It's only 25 centimeters now, so you can only get really to the distal sigmoid, and you could barely get you know, past um, the uh, UES. However, as this thing gets longer, and as our instruments get better, we may actually have the ability to do even more surgery. Like Nikhil was showing you the, um, the Zankers. Imagine if we had the ability to really do endosurgery, which is where I think we're going. Now, this is more therapeutic, but it's really interesting. Um, anybody know what food substance that is on the top left? Okay. It's your friendly neighborhood pepper. Um, and so right now, the the robotic scope is looking at it. And what I have here, this is the regular biopsy forceps in front of the TV monitor, just to give you an idea of the resolution. And this is the most beautiful 3D you've ever seen. You have these really cool glasses. They made the glasses actually look cool. They have these really cool glasses <laughs> on. And you can see in space, and you can literally hand one of these little seeds from one, one to the other. And it is so exact that, um, give you an idea, that's the manipulator. You see, I'm holding it on the, on the left. You can move up, down, left, right. You can rotate with your thumbs. And um, Seth had done the training first, Seth Gross, and sent me a Z that looked kind of like this. 
So not that we're competitive or anything, so I had to make a perfect figure eight. But they're tiny. This is a piece of chicken that you're burning into. And um, you can see how tiny, but how exact. So any drawn margin, imagine how exact. And first you outline, and then I did an ESD here, where you are able to hold up and retract and cut underneath. So this is being developed. Uh, it's not prime time yet at all, but just something fun to think about. And um, any of you are welcome to come over and play with this. We actually have it. What's nice is this is a real med surge collaboration. I do think that endoscopists need to work with the surgeons because this is, I think together we can do this. Our techniques of lifting polyps and removing them are very different than how surgeons lift and remove polyps. And I think they have experience with robots. And this is where um, we can combine our skills and do even better. What about non-invasive? So um, there's a lot of stuff that's uh, being developed non-invasively. Innovations in prep, which we still have not seen come to fruition. Anybody know when this is coming out? The, you know, Doug Rex presented this about a year and a half, two years ago, um, where, the, where the prep is integrated in the food and the drink. Um, there is Hygia Care, which is the irrigation. There's a scope, uh, that's a, a pill. Um, Invendo is making a disposable, um, really like joystick controlled scope. We know about CTC, uh, FIT, and FIT DNA, but what about blood tests and breath tests? And um, can we do this non invasively? So, the blood test. So, the septin 9 gene is what encodes to the protein, the cytokinesis. It's what's being looked at in the blood test that's in the septin test. And um, there was a lot of excitement initially. The sensitivity was about 50%. But even in the multicenter trial, although it did better than FIT with about 73% sensitivity, it still had decreased specificity. And no one has really included as part of the guideline. The good news is that there are a lot of people looking at different agents to detect uh, as a cancer screening test in the blood. And I do think within the next five years, we will have a better way of, of testing, almost as a first pass. I mean, this is the American dream, just do a blood test. But can you imagine if we had a blood test that gave us the same type of results, at least as good as some of the things that we're currently using, like FIT? Um, the other problem with the septin 9 is that it was picking up a lot later colorectal cancer, which is really not the process. We really want to find those earlier stages. So. What's interesting, there was one uh, study that looked at septa 9 and FIT, similar to the way FIT was combined with the DNA, and um, the sensitivity was quite high, but again, specificity not good enough. So what about a dog scan? Um, this, I've been disappointed to see, has not come out the way I thought it would be, but I'm going to still share it with you because I think there's a lot of good science why this might work. So um, turns out that dogs can sniff colorectal cancer. And um, in Japan, they had trained Labrador retrievers at uh, five different stool samples to sit in front of the stool sample that had cancer. And <laughs> remarkably, it had a 97%, now granted, it's a one out of five chance, but the dog, the dog, 97% time, would, would be able to detect the cancer specimen. And they also could do it with the breath, which I was really surprised at with over 90% sensitivity. So if a dog is smelling something, a joke, that if you're at an airport and the dog stops and sits in front of you, either you have you know, some type of explosive on you, or you have colon cancer. And my guess is you might be better off having colon cancer in that situation. So um, the point is that they're smelling something. Well, what could they possibly be smelling? And this is where this concept of volatile organic, organic compound um, and we know that a lot of these VOCs are generated in the colon. We also are learning that the microbiome is probably different at the level of a polyp and a cancer than it is on normal mucosa. And so is it possible that that change in microbiome emits a different VOC thumbprint, or in this case, breath print, um, and that we can detect cancer? And this group, who um, is, is from the Technion in Israel, has come up with all these different um, VOC type of uh, machine learning algorithm. So what is the VOC algorithm of someone with Crohn's disease or with lung cancer and it, or bladder cancer or with IBS? So it's really interesting that they're trying to get these different breath prints of different diseases. And what got me really excited was this slide. But I will tell you, this has not been validated. And when something's too good to be true, I always worry about it. But I share it because I do think there's some real 
exciting stuff here. If you look at the top left, this is a nanoarray analysis of breath for um, this CD1, which is just a proprietary amount of VOCs and different VOCs. That for patients who have colorectal cancer versus the controls, there's a real significant difference in the CD1, uh, which is what they use uh, marker. Now, what's amazing about it is that there's also a difference between colorectal cancer and adenomas. Adenomas versus control. Non-adenomas and advanced adenomas, non-advanced adenomas and advanced adenomas, advanced adenomas and control. I mean, this would be the perfect non-invasive way to say, does someone have a polyp? And if they have a polyp, is it an adenoma? And might even be a first pass to colonoscopy. And not to get worried for those of us who do colonoscopy, because could you imagine the number of patients? I mean, if we're getting adenoma detection rates of 50, 60 percent, we'll be inundated with colonoscopies. What's been disappointing is one, that I've been unable to get a hold of this technology and study, even though multiple times I thought I would. And two, I've not seen any more studies. This came out about two years ago. You'd think something this exciting would have follow-up. So who knows? But I think there's science behind why you might see this with the change in the microbiome we're finding locally in the colon, and that you have the technology, and dogs are detecting something. So the pieces all feel right. It's just a matter of getting the right technology and seeing if we can bring it Use. This would be the way it's being used, and um, Dr. Hike is at, at, um, in Israel has shared these photos and some of this data, and in this preliminary study, they're reporting that they get 85% sensitivity for cancer and 94% sensitivity for adenoma. Again, it seems too good, but it's something that I'm excited to try and um, explore, and for those of you who'd like to explore it with me, if you do get a hold of it, I'd love to do this collaboratively within the city. Um, so just to finish up, we're seeing increasing incidence in younger adults. That screening age of 45 I want to get back to, and just the importance of public outreach. So we're all aware of this, that when we look at incidence and mortality, for those younger than the age of 50, we're now seeing since about 2000, or even earlier, um, an uptick in the incidence and of the mortality for colorectal cancer. Now, I want to point out something really important. Whenever we look at data, we must look at our axis, okay? So if we look at our um, y-axis here, notice this is rate per 100,000. For the younger adults, we have 5, 10, 15. For the, um, I'm going to say, still younger, still younger adults, <laughs> just not as young adults, um, we're, we have 50, 100, 150. And for our, you know, young senior adults, um, we have, we're up to 500. Notice that it changes and it changes at a log level. So I like to look at the data this way. Now we have a log scale on our y-axis, 1, 10, 100, okay? And we're looking at incidence uh, rates by birth cohort. So if you were born in the 1960s, when you were in your 20s, this was your incidence rate. Um, your 30s, this is your incidence rate, et cetera, until you know, now you catch up to modern day, you're about 50 or 60. So notice that for our adults 55 and over, we have an incredibly exciting decrease in incidence of colorectal cancer. But for our younger adults, we're seeing an increase, but the numbers are still much lower than the older adults. This is really important. This is not some epidemiologic crisis. This is just an interesting trend that we have to explore and understand. Because if it continues, we're gonna start seeing our 45 and overs beginning to intersect with our 55 and older, meaning that the incidence of our younger adults is going to increase to the point with the dropping of our older adults where they overlap. And that is one of the reasons why we are concerned about this. Now, what we know is that young colorectal cancer is more common than distal, and that's why bleeding, particularly in 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds, they have rectal bleeding that has to be taken seriously. You should not just write it off to hemorrhoids. And for those of us who have diagnosed young patients with colorectal cancer, it's usually six months plus that they have rectal bleeding, they've been treated for hemorrhoids, and it's not inappropriate. It's just this is something we have to be aware of. Now, why is that? I really don't have a clue. I'm curious, Steve or Bruce or anybody have an idea? Um, I don't know. I, I think the microbiome and antibiotic could play a role. We know that there's um, so much more going on with the way the microbiome processes our diet. Maybe our diet becoming more rich in sugar, changing microbiome, the antibiotics. 
Um, I don't think it's obesity, uh, maybe physical exercise that drop. We just don't know. We really got to figure this out. There's some really important clue here that we need to figure out. And it may also explain why we saw that decrease early on in the 80s before we really were doing our widespread screening. So the American Cancer Society said 45, um, start screening at 45. They put this as a qualified recommendation, but it really has caused some issues because if we now have a discordance between what one society says, which by the way is not a GI society. Had the GI society come out and said this, said, oh, you know, we're trying to be self-serving, and we've been very careful not to do that and message it that any screening is better than none. But what are we gonna do about age 45? And that's why we had this meeting yesterday and um, one of the things that we decided is that the 80 by 18 campaign will be 50 and over. We're not going to include 45-year-olds. And that we really have to continue to look at the data. Every group has to look and make their own decision and recognize that we need a conversation. My solution personally has been if someone wants to start screening age 45, and FIT is not a bad way to start with a younger adult. We talk about more distal disease, talk about bleeding. Um, if they want to have a colonoscopy, I'm fine doing it. But I think there are other options we just have to be aware of that we can screen with as alternatives because if insurance doesn't pay for it, as we all know, it can be quite expensive to have a colonoscopy. Um, this is the data that they use to make a recommendation besides the SEER data that I just showed you. So there were two micro simulations. It's all modeling data, and that's been a lot of the criticism. But if you look at the life years gain for col this is colonoscopy every 10 years, you can see the life years gains are 429 versus, say, FIT yearly at the age over 50, it's 377. This, in the graphic form, this is colonoscopy. The blue represents age 45, the gray represents age 50. Notice that even age 50 of colonoscopy still improves life years gain than any other modality, even starting at age 45. But starting at age 45 with colonoscopy in this micro simulation, has the highest life years gain. And there was a lot of different, I mean, there was a lot of effort put in these models. And Anne Zauber was one of the um, lead people involved. And Anne Zauber was also one of the, really one of the founders of the National Polyp Study, along with Sid Winwer. There's a lot of good people with a lot of good validation on the simulation. So this shouldn't, models are important, because otherwise we have to wait years for data. I think it's very compelling. and. Um, I think it puts us in a difficult place because there is this um, disagreement in guidelines, and what it leads to is confusion in our patients. So we just have to make sure that we understand the data so we can have an honest conversation with our patients. This was a nice paper put out by Peter Liang and colleagues just looking at what the intended consequences were, decreasing colorectal cancer and preventing it in the 45 and older group preventing it in high-risk minority groups, meaning if we don't now just focus on African Americans, see everyone at age 45, now we hit every demographic, including African Americans and others at higher risk. And we increase our screening rates for the 50-year-olds. I just diagnosed someone at age 52 two days ago. It actually has not happened to me in a long time. Screening colonoscopy, large tumor in the descending colon. Um, strictly no symptoms at all. And he's 52. Well, why didn't he get a screening at 50? If he got his 50, that may have been a large polyp at that point. And, you know, it just took him a while, as we all see. So if you start at 45, maybe we can get more 50-year-olds in over screen. But there's a cost. We may divert resources to the younger population that could be used for a lower risk or an underserved population. Disparities may, risk, may increase because of that. And then we now are not able to study that 45 and over group if they're starting to get screened. And uh, as always, our benefits may actually fall short of predictions, particularly if we don't exactly know why we're seeing such an increased benefit. So finally, I just want to end with our 80 by 18 campaign. As I mentioned, David's going to be giving a talk at the ACG. We're 50 and over. This has been a real fun campaign to just get people motivated. Um, Mary Dorshank, Emily Bell, and Dion Christopher are really the three people behind this at the level of the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. Um, can we get over the 80% bar? I'm going to use this as an advertisement for David's talk. The answer is yes, but not everybody. We're not going to, we're not going to get the country over 80%. We're lucky we can get the country over 70%. But there are groups, like for example, the VA is over 80% right now. So there are groups, and when they get over the bar, they get a nice little badge, they get a nice little badge, and they get in the Hall of Fame, and they're recognized. But I do think we can do it. I don't know if you know screening rates here at Mount Sinai. We're still struggling to get over 80%. Yeah, and we're still struggling to get over 80%. 
but the VA has done it. And I think the campaign allows for a conversation at Target. We're trying to come up, what's it going to be called after 2018? Because it ends at the end of 2018, obviously. We thought it was going to be 80 and beyond, but we heard yesterday that there might be some other, other things. So what happens if we get to 80 by 18? What, what would happen if we were able to really screen 80%? We would um, prevent about 270,000 cases of colorectal cancer and prevent 200,000 colorectal cancer deaths. I like to think of it as Yankee Stadium. Yankee Stadium has about 54,000 people. When you go to the stadium, you always miss like the most people in the whole world. And there's still that excitement when you go in the stadium. You, you just see all the people and the green of the grass. Not yesterday. But not yet. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, 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 or our Giants. I don't, even talk, I don't want to talk about a New York team. Or our Jets. But think about one person there. And we're talking about five Yankee stadiums in cases and almost three and in, in in three quarters Yankee stadium in terms of uh, number of deaths. It's just such a significant amount. And when you think about what it means to be part of a team, this is our team. And I think we played you guys once. We want to play you guys again. We're the NYU Gastros. And I think we, we, we really can't play softball. We can't play baseball. But we love wearing our T-shirts because – that's the back of the t-shirt, and our logo is just so much fun. We get the runs. <laughs> and you got to love walking around Manhattan with a t-shirt that says, we get the runs. So I'll leave you with that. I'm sure everybody sees the cow. Hopefully that cow won't walk down the street of, of New York. And I said, it's so great to be back with our extended family. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, this is New York. No one cares about t-shirts that say, we get the rest. <laughs> <laughs> no one bats an island. Uh, you know, great talk. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One is about U-turns in the ascending colon and rectum as a metric for quality. And, what right. I think. and the other wordy, more wordy question for many of us is that over 70 group, yeah. where they're all coming in saying, well, I don't need it anymore because I'm over 70. Right. without any respect to what their history has been in the findings. So what are the, what are the guidelines for the elderly? Mm -hmm. I'll start with that first, because the guidelines for the elderly, it's really when you start getting after 85, they say no. Truthfully, before that, the guidelines are mixed, but it's a conversation. You have a young, healthy 70-year-old. I mean, 70 is the new 50, really. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry is the new 30. I don't know Jerry. Um, but... I mean, we all know, I mean, 70 and even, even 80, there are so many 80-year-olds who are so active and vibrant and healthy. I think it's a conversation. There are risks and benefits. There are alternatives to colonoscopy. You might switch to a FID or a FID DNA. Steve, there's a concern about older patients with hypermethylation, whether there's more false positive. But um, I think it's a conversation. I, I would never say no to someone based on age unless they're really over the age of we're not, well, unless they're elderly. Uh, and there are a lot of older patients who are youthful. And, um, you know, that's the definition of elderly. Uh, but the guidelines, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force says stop at 75. If someone has polyps, that's now surveillance. That's not screening anymore. Steve, do you have any other thoughts about that? Yeah, I think more often than not, I, I find that it's the doctors that are reluctant yeah. to say to yeah. somebody, you don't need another colonoscopy yeah. because we're so defensive in our practice. I have to say, I'm finding myself in the last couple of months only telling patients they don't need colon. You know, they're coming, they, they're told a 10-year interval, and they come back in five years or five years, and they come back in three years, and they're told they don't have to be here. I think a lot of doctors are uncomfortable telling someone they don't need a test. Yeah, I think a lot of it is on us, not so much on the patient. I, I agree. And also, uh, if you look at someone who's not had polyps, and one of the things that the National Polyp Study showed, there was a low-risk cohort of no polyp, which really had a decreased risk of colorectal cancer lifetime. So for someone who's not had polyps, I feel a little more comfortable either stopping or switching to an FIP. Um, if my feeling there is um, it has a sensitivity in the 70% so for cancer, and if there's a false positive, I would offer a colonoscopy anyhow. But um, Steve can talk a little bit about colonoscopy. Yeah, I, you know, cold art, I've been using cold art more to try to avoid colonoscopy. So with Cologuard, um, it, 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 has a, um, it has a sensitivity for colon cancer about 92 or 93 percent, which is better than 50 to 70 percent. Um, but the negative predictive value is what's important. If you get a, you get a negative Cologuard test in a patient, there's a 0.06 percent chance that they have cancer. That's pretty 
pretty long. Um, so I basically tell them if you have a negative polar guard, there's practically no chance that you have cancer. Right. Now, it's not the same right, for polyps. Right. Okay. Right. And you know, the I've been around okay. long enough. We used to think of screening for cancer. Now we're screening for polyps. And it's true. And I tell patients we could be missing a polyp. It's true. But if we do the polar guard now, the interval is supposed to be three years. You know, we should we'll repeat it again. In fact, it's funny. I just got a letter in the mail last week. I think um, Jamie Eisenberg told me he got the same one. I've been using col. I was one of the early adopters of polar guard. I now got a letter. It's now been three years so <laughs> since 2015 when it launched, and they said you were one of the early adopters of polar guard. The next page lists the patients of yours that had negative polar guards three years ago. You may want to contact them again. And I got a list of my patients yeah, that's great. that had, I mean, it's a navigated test. Yeah, it is. And like, when do we ever get that from a pit? Or, you know? It's just they're a little more, they're going to yeah. the sense the uh, specificity is less. So you're going you're to see patients with more false positive, and there may be more hypermethylation. And that is yeah, the elderly, yeah, there's an age-related methylation effect so that um, a lot of the false positives in the elderly age-related normal methylation of uh, DNA in the lung because of which exact science is, is getting, getting ready to launch another deep sea study in the 45 to 49 age group. And the thinking is that with the same polar guard test, yeah. the thinking is that it'll be even better yeah. because the younger you are, the fewer false positives. Yeah, I, I mean, truthfully, I think that's going to be the way to go with our younger patients. The reason I like fit is just because it's so cheap. It's yeah. up. But if there was a way to do that screen and get it approved. So by the way, retroflexion. Um, really hasn't been shown to improve uh, ADR in, um, in, in some studies, in others it has it. If it's easy to do, fine. I don't do it anymore because I have that uh, endocuff on, which pulls back the fold so nicely. I think it's a nice thing. I don't think you have to push it. I think a high quality colonoscopy will be around the fold probably is what we should do. And there's also been mixed data on the retroflex and the rectum. I do it on almost every patient. It's easy, again, if there's a reason why you can't. Chris. Um, so where in the quality where in the quality world does management of so we find all these polyps, but we know that sometimes polyps are inappropriately referred to surgery or, or unnecessarily undergo surgical resection where they can be safely, easily, and effectively removed and So where where is that yeah. falling? So quality? that's interesting. That actually came up in one of our recent conversations. In the metrics it says you should be removing every polyp two centimeters or less. That's in the quality metric of polyp. Once you get above two centimeters, the feeling is if you're not comfortable um, removing larger polyps or flat polyps, you can refer. Um, it has to be a QA at the level of the institution because it's, there's no one qualifier that would definitely say needs to go to surgery versus needs to go um, endoscopically. When you look at what these guys are able to remove, I mean, all of us look like it's a, five years ago, we probably wouldn't even attempted some of these things. And now we have other types of devices. So I think you have to set your own standard and review them, particularly when they're complications. But we could not find, if you can come up with a metric that we could use, that then we can create a you know, quality metric around that. Very tough. It's usually when you review the case, look at the images, does it lift, how big is it, where is it located, um, that, and what was done surgically. You know, a lot of transanal stuff now might go the way of an endoscopic robot, which is now getting I think that's fine. Awesome. I think it's the penicolectomies. No, I agree. For, you know, polyps that I think experience the hospice. Yeah, I, I, I fortunately come up with a metric. We come up with our, you know, guidelines are strictly based on validating metrics. And some of them aren't that validated. You know, as you know, they're the best consensus. So. One last question from Ari. Uh, comment and a question. Comment is, I don't see it now. I see it very <laughs> yeah. I've been using this image for over 20 years, and you see these little two dots here? Um, very often I'll make a face appear with these being the eyes. I was going to do it, but, you know, I, I just figured that uh, I, I would grow up a little bit. <laughs> my question is, in terms of looking at the identifying, are you using NPI to do the colonoscopy? You know what, I, I have not found a great, truthfully, there's been almost no time where I've seen some NPI that I have not seen something. Like I might turn it on when I see something, but I've not really found a benefit. Um, actually, we're using something really cool now, a new augmented reality um, device attached, and we're studying to see if it can pick up things that we can't see. So it's, you have two screens, a separate screen, 
And all of a sudden, a little red box will appear on the other screen that it sees something that it thinks is Apollo. And then you can look. And I will tell you, so far, it has not found anything that I haven't seen. But it's pretty good at seeing, particularly like the flat stuff, because it looks for things like the reflection off of that little um, egg drop suit or um, other little bindings. And, and, and you can program, particularly with the augmented reality, a overlay. And it's pretty interesting. So that may come where we get an augmented reality assist. But um, right now, uh, I think that the polyps that we're trying to find um, have not been improved with any of these other techniques again. Uh, Jerry, do you find any benefit of the act? No. Not at all. <laughs> Well, reluctantly, we're going to have to end it there. Thank and you so thanks. Much.